Good morning again. Uh, this is Neil Lee again from CMB, uh, NHK Capital Partners. Um, I'm joined by Mr. Matthew Temple, my, my senior associate. Um, and uh, today we'll be going through um, our latest offering, um, the reserve at Mansfield, Texas. Um, and a couple housekeeping items. Um, after the presentation, uh, we're expecting to have a Q&A session. So um, during the presentation, if you have questions, uh, please uh, upload them, uh, type them in into the Q&A box, um, and uh, Matthew will be monitoring them, and at the end, we'll, we'll uh, try to answer as many of the, uh, the questions that we have received. Um, and so uh, with that, um, usually Noreen Hogan, our, our president and principal of NHK Capital Partners, uh, would start out by giving us an introduction to NHK Capital Partners. Um, she's on, on maternity leave, so she could not join us today. So um, I'll be hosting uh, the, the presentation from here on. Uh, and again, uh, at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. So uh, during this whole conversation, if you could upload your questions on the Q&A box, then they will, we'll address them as many as, as, we, as we can. Um, so starting from the top, um, we're NHK Capital Partners, um, a part of a, a Hogan company. And um, you know, we strive to provide uh, you know, value-driven investment opportunities in the US commercial real estate sector. Um, we try to uh, structure them into a passive investments um, so that, you know, from anywhere in the world, um, you can enjoy the, the exposure um, of, of investing into the U.S. Uh, commercial real estate sector um, through our, our uh, partnerships. Um, NHK uh, actually was developed um, through our uh, sister company, CMB Regional Centers, uh, the, the principals, the, the team behind um, NHK um, are also behind the CMB Regional Centers, and many of you will know us from CMB. Um, and uh, it, it truly was an organic growth uh, opportunity for us, um, whereby the, the you know, 5,800 plus um, limited partners and, and, and um, clients that we have under the CMB banner um, have asked us to, you know, uh, provide them with uh, an opportunity to, to continue to invest with, uh, with our team. And so NHK tries to, to, to achieve that. And uh, we're very grateful for, for that opportunity. Uh, as I mentioned, um, under the CMB platform, CMB Regional Centers platform, uh, we've been around since 1997, and, and we're um, one of the, the oldest uh, existing regional centers that are in operation today. Um, to date, we have about $3 billion in, in, in EV-5 capital that's been deployed into um, 80 plus partners, uh, EV-5 partnerships. Um, we uh, take care of uh, 50, over 5,800 you know, high net worth clients from 103 countries. Uh, we have done projects in, in a, a, a very diverse array of, of commercial real estate uh, asset classes in logistics, which has been a hot commodity, um, you know, since the advent of, of, of the pandemic for, for obvious reasons. Hospitality, uh, residential, multifamily, student housing, office, mixed use, the whole gamut. Um, and our ability to uh, work with individuals throughout the world. Um, we speak uh, over you know, 10, 12 languages just at the, at the headquarters alone, um, enables us to, to really cater to, to the needs of, of our, our, our investors. So before I go into the, the project specifics and um, you know, explanation of, of the reserve um, at Mansfield, um, I wanted to venture what our investment thesis was here. And um, those of you, and I see a lot of familiar names on our participants list today, um, but those of you who have uh, you know, joined us for our uh, previous seminar um, on the storybook McKinney, uh, this might sound very familiar. We have some updated figures, statistics, uh, which again, just bolsters our, our investment thesis. 
um, into the single family rental um, space. Um, but um, we'll go from here and then we'll, we'll um, discuss about the, the location, which is always important in, in real estate, um, and then go on to um, you know, discussing about the, the, the specifics of, of, of the reserve. So the first question that, that we pose ourselves is, okay, um, you know, we're in a somewhat changed world. Uh, the pandemic had, you know, ravaged the world um, in, in, you know, in, in any sense of the word. Um, and now we're, we're about 18 months in, you know, since the, the, the advent of the pandemic, especially in, in, in the U.S. Um, at least. Um, and so in this environment, you know, what is a good investment thesis? Um, and we've looked at, you know, how strong the, 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 the residential market has been doing. Um, and um, specifically the, the single family rental uh, properties. So what is SFR? Why is why SFR? First off, um, single family rental is ex exactly how it sounds. Um, it's a rental property that are horizontally developed. So these are your, your single family homes, your town homes that are um, you know, up for, for, you know, for, for renters. Um, and the first reason behind why SFR would be the demographic trends that we're seeing today. So uh, without the, the cliche um, description of the, the millennial generation, um, actually the statistics you know, show a pretty clear picture that uh, the current 20s to their 30s, um, you know, the, the millennial generation tend to you know, rent longer, um, than the previous generations. So I found a pretty interesting statistics on, you know, the, the early boomers uh, in their 20s and 30s, 35% was owner occupied uh, versus 61% was renting. Um, and late boomers, 67% was renting. Uh, Gen X, that's my generation, 62% uh, was renting, but the millennials, that jumps to about 74%. And you know, there's conversations about why the millennials are renting um, more and longer, and you know that sometimes takes the, the the form of you know because of the 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 um, inflated value of homes, um, the stagnant wages, that that sort of conversations. But also, I think more and more we're seeing a, a change in priorities, um, and and you know. People getting married later in their lives, um, and you know, buying homes later in their lives. Um, but also, interestingly, the um, the luxury car market, and this is just you know, off off the off the to the side. Um, Sixty percent of all the the leases of uh, luxury cars are uh, clientele in their twenty to thirties. So you can really see the the the, the shift in in priorities. I think. The other um, factor, and especially that de delineates between the, the, the traditional rental properties, which are typically the, the multifamily, you know, the five-story garden wrap style apartments um, to this single family rental properties is probably the, the, the impact that the pandemic had uh, on us. So, you know, throughout the, the pandemic, we've seen people, you know, uh, pursuing more space, trying to distance, you know, from each other, um, not willing to live on top of each other, but, but you know, from away from each other um, to less populated neighborhoods. Um, and also because of the advent of, of working remotely, now we can, you know, afford to move away from the centers, you know, the, the employment centers, the, the cities, you know, downtowns um, into more affordable and more, you know, lessly densely, less densely populated areas. And, you know, we're, we're tr truly seeing that trend and we'll see some, some stats on that as well. Um, also the COVID-19 intensified our, you know, our, our desire for housing security as well as, uh, you know, public health concerns uh, for especially the, the you know, the, the families. Um, and again, so that kind of drives this whole um, shift toward, you know, this demand to, toward um, single family rental properties. 
And um, you know, on the other side, on, on, the, on the demand side, if you look at, um, the housing price has been going up and up you know, since um, you know, 2020. Uh, we're at a historically low inventory rate, but then the, the supply isn't you know, quick at catching up because of mm, the, the supply chain you know, challenges that, that we're, we're experiencing today. Um, the value appreciation, and this has been updated to the latest figure, um, year on year increase um, the, on, on quarter three of, of 2021, we're seeing about a 19% hike from 2000, um, uh, even 20 level. So it, it, the, the, the appreci level of appreciation on these uh, you know, homes are, are truly staggering. Um, th this, you know, the the advantage of, of being, you know, 18, 19 months into this, um, this pandemic era, we're seeing, a, you know, data trickling um, out from um, how, you know, people moved, the socioeconomic changes that, that the COVID had um, on, on, on the society. And this is a look at uh, U.S. Uh, Postal Service address change um, data. And here it's it essentially showing that, you know, 82% of the urban centers, the, the traditional urban uh, employment centers have seen a net decrease in population. So people moving out of city centers, in 91% of suburban counties seeing a cert, uh, an increase in, in moving in. So, you know, putting them together, you, you, we're seeing a, a, a pretty strong trend of people moving away from urban centers into um, urban, uh, suburban counties or, or, or you know, sub suburbs. And again, that I think, uh, you know, explains well um, what we just talked about, the desire for people to, to kind of pan out, to, to enjoy more space, the ability to, to do so um, because of the, you know, work remote uh, ability that we, we've uh, newly found, um, you know, since last year. And this is all driving that, that shift away from urban centers into, you know, suburbs. Um, this is a traditional look at the overall housing stock in the U.S. Um, and depending on, on which statistics you look at, um, it's the, the overall housing stock in the U.S. is, you know, perceived to be about 120 million, you know, units uh, of, of, of housing stock. And roughly two-thirds of that is owner-occupied, uh, and a third of that is renter-occupied. Um, however, the renter-occupied are heavily um, weighted toward multifamily. Um, so, I, and, and that's very intuitive, right? So if you think of a, a rental unit, typically the first image you have in your mind are multifamily apartments. Um, and, you know, they account for two thirds of that rental market. Um, however, uh, as we saw, you know, there's a, a shift in, in, in trend in demand to, you know, rent single family homes in, into suburbs. And, and what that means is right now, until, so, so far, uh, the single family home is still very heavily owner occupied, uh, but you know this it, it, this provides a, a large you know ground whereby the single family rental market can actually grow into. And and on the next slide, we're actually seeing that happening in in real time. And uh, again, those of you who have joined me in, in our last conversation about Storybook in McKinney, the, it's a, uh, it was a single family rental property, um, very similar in, in, in type, in, in asset type, in, in you know, the same developer. This is like a, uh, a continuation of, of that series, in, in a sense. You would have seen the first, the, the, um, first six, seven lines where we were talking about institutional investments into the single family rental space. So, and this is just in, you know, since 2020. So in the last, you know, 18 month, 18, 20 months, um, we've seen firms like Invesco uh, commit $5 billion in purchasing 20,000 single family rental homes, you know, over the next three years. Leonard and Central Bridge, another large institution, 
committing $4 billion, great golf group, $200 million, Rock Point, Home Builder Direct, you know, 1.5, Nuveen. But the, the blue um, are additional um, announcements that were made since our, our last webinar in, in early August. So in the last 60 days, we've all already seen Blackstone, um, you know, announced another investment into the single family rental um, space by acquiring home, um, you know, uh, Tricon Residential in, in, in Canada for $300 million. Brookfield is another large private equity um, institution out of, uh, you know, New York City. They've acquired Conrex, um, JP Morgan, um, Aries and, and Pridium also, um, they've acquired uh, Front Yard Residential for $2.4 billion. And by virtue of that deal, they now control 60,000 homes and all for, for rental. And this list will continue to grow. What's fascinating, however, is all these monies that are going into this, this single family rental space still is only accounting for about 2% of, of, of uh, the the stock, the inventory. So our first investment thesis. So if we can build a, a good product, a, a good single family rental um, property uh, that is centrally managed with, and as you will see, with you know, great amenities, a community you know, resort style pool, work space, you know, office space that, that will allow you to, you know, come to the, 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 the clubhouse um, and, you know, work remotely instead of having to commute to work, um, green space, all of this combined, then likely in, in, you know, in 24 months, you know, 30 months time when this is constructed, this is occupied, this is stabilized, we'll find buyers. We'll find buyers and at, at, at good you know, valuations. Our first investment thesis. Um, okay, then, okay, that, that's good, Neil. Uh, but okay, let's look into what the, the local market looks like then. Because again, you know, real estate is about location and location. Um, for those of us who aren't too familiar with the, the, the Dallas-Fort Worth Metro, um, Mansfield, by the way, is a, a DFW, uh, as we call it, uh, suburb. Um, DFW, or Dallas-Fort Worth, is the fourth largest um, um, MSA, uh, fourth largest city um, metro in, in the US. And uh, it boasts uh, over you know, 7 million residents. DFW has seen an exponential growth over the, the last, you know, over a decade um, in, in population and, um, you know, corporations that are, that are relocating into this area. Um, it's a typical 2 to 3% um, population increase every year. Um, and, you know, since 2010, that adds up to over, you know, 15% in, in population growth alone. Um, many reasons why, um, good weather, one of them, uh, it, but um, also, you know, the, the business and tax friendly uh, regulations. So Texas, you know, famously does not have a, a state income tax. Um, the DFW area uh, is very well diversified in terms of its industry base. So it's not just energy. It's not just services. It's got manufacturing. It's got technology. Texas Instrument is 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 um, you know headquartered here. Um, Toyota, Samsung, you know, you name it. So it's a very well diversified industry base, which is which is creating a a, a, a virtuous loop, I would think. I would say, uh, inviting other firms to 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 uh, move move to to this area. Um, on the other hand, um, DFW still boasts a, a cheaper cost of living, especially compared to you know, either coasts of, of the US. Um, DFW, wh whereby average wage is at $67,500, which is higher than the Texas you know, general average. Um, the, for example, the, the medium rent um, expenditures for, for households 
is below that of the, the US um, average. So I think you know, that's just one indication of, of the, the cheaper cost of living as compared to uh, other parts of the, the, the country. And especially so if you're considering you know, com and comparing with the you know, either sides of, of, of the coast. Um, this is a, another view, um, a visual view of, of all the uh, migration of, of, of firms, uh, relocation expansions into you know, Texas, DFW, and Texas in general. And um, uh, you know, we've talked about the, the USPS or US you know, Postal Service data previously, but just looking at DFW alone, um, you know, it, just in 2020, there were 16,000 households that moved from California, which was about a 20%, you know, uh, increase from 2019 figures. 4,500 moving from New York, another, I think, uh, um, 3,500 3, or so from, from Chicago. So from these large metropolitan areas into, um, you know, DFW. And um, the, the firms that have relocated into Texas, there are too many to name. Um, you know, in Frisco, you have the Toyota headquarters, Toyota America headquarters. Oracle announced their move earlier in the year. CBRE, again, 2021, Samsung uh, just announced a large expansion of their uh, footprint here um, toward Austin. Um, Charles Schwab, JP Morgan Chase has a, a very large campus here in, in DFW. And um, interestingly, Tesla, um, I think uh, a couple webinars back, we were still talking about the, the migration into Texas. And at the time, Tesla had just announced that they were you know, building their new gigafactory uh, in Texas. And uh, fast forward, you know, merely a few months, and now uh, I just saw on the news that they're moving their headquarters to, te to, to Texas. So I think that's indicative of, of the, you know, the, the strength that, that, you know, the overall DFW in, in this area holds um, for, you know, for, for these uh, migrations of, of firms and jobs. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the Chamber of Commerce is, is actually tracking over 200 active relocations and expansions into, into uh, you know, DFW. So in regard to um, the DFW, you know, where is Mansfield and, and what is Mansfield, you know, why is Mansfield a, a good location? Well, first off, um, as the, the name indicates, um, DFW has two main, you know, cores, two, two downtowns, uh, Fort Worth on the west and Dallas on, on the east side. So uh, if you look, at, look it up on, on a map, it, it looks like a, uh, a double yoked egg. I guess that's the best way to put it. Um, and uh, Mansfield is actually located south of those both two, you know, um, um, centers. Um, 20 miles uh, southeast from Fort Worth and 30 miles um, southwest from, from Dallas. So it's, it's, a, it's it on a strategic location, very well um, developed infrastructure whereby, you know, you can zoom anywhere in the, in the DFW metro in, you know, in, in about 30 minutes. The DFW airport is just north of, of Mansfield. So that's a, a pretty easy drive as well. So it's truly a strategic location, uh, but not just that. Uh, Mansfield itself um, has many quality uh, employers. Um, it's, it's well known for its healthcare industry, um, you know, in Mansfield and just across the street from our, our project, which you will see in a few slides down. Um, the, the Methodist Mansfield Medical Center is there. Uh, it's, it's a full service hospital that serves the, the overall, you know, southern part of the DFW metro. And so you can imagine the, the, the number of, you know, um, healthcare employees that, that work there, you know, that make uh, Mansfield home. Um, and, um, not just that, um, it's also got a, a great school district. Um, it's got rated uh, an A rating from Texas Education Agency in 2019, which was the last year of, of, of uh, 
of the rating. Um, 2020, as, as we experienced, you know, it wasn't a good year for, for, for schools. So um, they skipped this rating for, for last year. Um, some social socioeconomic snapshot into Mansfield. Um, it's a, again, it's a, it's a highly educated, economically active, well-paid, you know, suburb um, of, you know, Fort Worth and Dallas. Um, median age, 35.9 years. So, the, you know, the, the, the population is, the, the median age of the population is, you know, at the height of their productivity. Um, the median household income is 99,500. Uh, which is about, you know, close to 40% over the Texas median. But median doesn't tell the entire picture. Um, if you look at closer, as you can see on the, on the uh, chart on your left, 40% um, of the household is in the 75 to $150,000 income, household income bracket. 25% is over $150,000 bracket. So, you have a situation where the average household income exceeds the median household income at $128,260. So again, uh, and, and one last, you know, I guess data point is the, the education level. So 94% um, of the, the population has a high school degree. 42% uh, uh, again, aggregately have a bachelor or higher um, degree. So it's a well-educated, you know, a, a prosperous neighborhood, um, a suburb um, is, is the, the picture, I should say. Um, just on the, going back to the supply side, and, and I've mentioned this already, um, but um, there's a chronic shortage of, of housing in DFW um, because of the incoming influx of, of you know, jobs and, and, and population, but also the, the market has not been able to, to keep up with the, the demand. Um, and therefore, um, you know, there's been, so far there's about 22,000 unit deficiency in the marketplace in, in overall DFW. Um, however, this is only, you know, it, it seems like this is only going to get worse, worse because um, through 2020, um, because of the, the, the disruptions in the supply chain, um, there just wasn't, you know, enough delivery um, that would have um, helped with this shortage. So I think, you know, it, the, the consensus is that the, the market will you know, continue to experience this, this, this undersupply, uh, which obviously will you know, drive up prices um, coming years. Now, finally, to uh, the actual site location. Um, and in front of you, you see a, a pretty mm, colorful you know, map. Um, and this is actually a 200 acre uh, master plan development of the, the center of, of Mansfield, um, Texas. And so, as you see, uh, this is all new development, the, the, um, the highlighted areas in, in, in different colors. But as you can see, there's a new city hall that's coming in, um, along with it, additional you know, green space and surrounding commercial, entertainment, you know, retail, office, um, space that are being, you know, developed as we speak. And our site, the reserve at Mansfield, the single family rental site is just across the street from this. And uh, it's, it's part of, again, the, the master plan development. And one additional benefit of being part of this, uh, this uh, master plan is that there is a what we call a TERS or tax increment redevelopment zoning um, uh, available for the project. So what this is is it's a it's a it's a tool that the you know municipal governments like the city of Mansfield or the county uses in order to uh, to promote and incentivize developments in certain areas. And so they designate this area. And they provide um, uh, financial support. So, by and and the rationale on their on the city side is that 
you know, with the new development, their tax base is going to increase. So in a sense, they're giving back some of that increase in tax base back to the developer, the owner, so that they're incentivizing additional developments in this specific area. So for our project, as you will see, uh, again, a few slides down, there's uh, $4 million that are uh, uh, being provided uh, through the, this TERS um, program. So uh, again, um, one additional thing that I want to mention, and this you might not be able to see it too clearly because it's blurred out, but on the north side of the Matlock Road, um, this is the, the Mansfield, Methodist Mansfield um, Hospital that I mentioned. And so it's literally a throw, stone's throw away. And you know you, you cross the street and you're at, at, at the hospital. So again, I think there is, this will be another big selling point for those uh, people working in, in this uh, industry, in, in the healthcare industry, you know, the, the proximity um, of, of, you know, your work to, the, to your home, potentially. Um, this is a look at the, the uh, unit mix. So um, over a 21 acre lot um, were, Proposing, and then by the way, this has all been entitled, obviously, uh, to build 249 uh, units. Uh, there are going to be townhomes, uh, two-story townhomes, um, and by by you know mandate of, of city ordinance, um, and they're going to you know run the gamut from you know one bed to three beds, and um, the average rent that is used under our performa uh, projections is 1.96 per square foot. And we'll, we'll have some additional discussions of, of what that level of, of rent really means. Um, but um, and with an average size of you know, 1,300 square feet, so it's not a small unit. It's, it, it's, it's truly you know, amenable for, for families, for young families, for, you know, for, for kid, with kids. Um, and you know that will yield about a, a 26, 2700 um, per unit, you know, average rent. Um, so again, uh, as I mentioned, the it's going to be a a, a community, um, you know, gated, and also it will have uh, gated in the sense that it, it won't have you know walls or anything, but in in a centrally operated, centrally managed um, you know fashion. Uh, it will have fitness facilities, resort style pools, um, shared office space so that you can work remotely um, and, and green areas, all of this. Um, and again, um, a very good you know, access to the, the infrastructure, to, to the road um, system, uh, Highway 360, Route 287, you know, depending on whether you want to go you know, east to Dallas, west to Fort Worth, it, it's an easy, easy drive. So back to the, um, the, the underwriting um, assumptions and especially the, the, the per square foot rental. Um, so unfortunately, well, actually I shouldn't say unfortunately, um, <laughs> Mansfields uh, does not have a comparable to our single family rental um, you know, proposition. So the, the only types of um, rental units that are existent in the marketplace today are all multifamily, you know, uh, five-story plus, you know, apartments. And these are the indications of, of the, the apartments that are in existence today. And if you see, you know, their, their rent levels are, you know, 1.9 per square foot uh, for the most comparable one that was built in 2019. There's a new one that was just built, but it's still going through um, um, lease up. So I, I probably wouldn't use this number for now because you know during lease up there is promotions and all these kinds of stuff that that might affect the or, or skew the the the, the data. Um, the interesting thing, it, I apologize, is the occupancy, the or the high level of occupancy. Um, the 
the overall occupancy is is above you know 95 percent 90 you know 97 98 percent so they're they're essentially fully leased if, if you consider the the friction between you know one uh, family leaving and another leaving, you know, moving in. So, um, you know, similar to the, the friction in, 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 um, in other statistics, this is, you know, seen as a, as a, as a full lease up. And so, you know, it, it's a market with, with all the, the, the assets, the rental assets out there that are fully leased. Um, our underlying assumption, uh, I'll, I'll reiterate, is that in you know we'll complete construction by 2024 or start lease up in 2024. Um, 249 units. Um, our average per square foot um, uh, space is 13 or 1400 square feet. So, uh, so essentially larger than the existing inventory. Um, and at a at 1.96 per square foot. And we're expecting 95% occupancy. So the I guess the in, the picture I'm trying to paint is that we're not overboard, you know, optimistically, you know, inflating our numbers in, in terms of our, our outlook. Uh, we're using, you know, well adjusted uh, conservative numbers, and and you'll further see why I say that. Now, because um, in this specific you know, location, we don't have a, a, a direct comparison to uh, what other single family rentals might do. What the market researcher um, did was looked at the overall DFW market, submarkets, and try to elicit, you know, what kind of uh, premium uh, a single family rental property would yield um, on top of a, a uh, a typical traditional, you know, multifamily apartment. As I mentioned, the, the trend is in, uh, and the trend is is following, and 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 you know, for the SFR properties. And what they found in you know the other neighbor, other suburbs within the DFW market, is that um, the premium SFR to to um, multifamily, you know ranges from 27% to 57% at the high end. Um, and so averaging that out, it's about a 39% premium over uh, multifamily for, for single family assets. So going back to this sheet, what that means is this 1.96 uh, per square foot, uh, you know, you could make an argument that, you know, with the, the premium um, that, these single family rental properties um, would yield, uh, we could go all the way up to $2.4 you know, um, per square foot, $2.45 per square foot, and still be um, you know, competitive as compared to the other um, existing multifamilies. But we're not doing that. We're, we're just kind of you know, stopping at 1.96. Um, and in order to be you know, on, on the conservative side, Um, as I mentioned, you know, they're going to be mostly uh, townhomes and th that's a uh, uh, city new ordinance. They, the, the city does not want to, you know, I guess they, they want to have a, 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 a more um, uh, dense use of, 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 of land. And therefore, the, the, the uh, entitlement is for townhomes, um, two-story townhomes. Um, for this project, we're so far expecting uh, a, an, about an $82 million budget, um, and we're going to source that by getting a senior loan of $58.8 million, uh, another mezzanine loan of $88 million. So together, the overall debt stack will be in the, in the 80 81% range. Um, and again, you know, subject to, to further change, but that's the, the, the expectation. Um, and the budget is so far um, being firmed up and uh, they, it will have some fluctuations, but it, it won't you know, fluctuate too much. Uh, the NHK partner will own 70% of the project with an $11.1 .1 million uh, contribution. The sponsor partner or the developer partner will own 30% with a 4.8 
uh, $7.6 million contribution. Again, in the $82 million, it includes a $4 million TERS, uh, which is subject to reimbursement. So according to the terms of this um, tax increment uh, financing, um, upon completion, there's a, a $2 million um, uh, reimbursement by, by the city. And then uh, there is a rebate um, on, on an annual basis going forward uh, during operations. And what this will mean is, it, this will carry on to the next buyer. So it, it will um, not only help with the, the prospect of, 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 of um, selling this property at the end, um, you know, at, at our exit, but also this will be reflected into the, the sale price. So, you know, essentially the true cost of, of building therefore is 82 minus four, so $78 million, if you will. The use of it, uh, as you see on the on the chart to the right, is you know ten percent of it is is in land cost. Uh, the land is under contract, um, and the hard cost is about seventy percent of the cost, and so on. Um, NHK uh, deal structure again. This is um, for those of you who have joined me today and who are familiar with the CMB structure, partnership structure, or Again, I, I see many familiar names who have invested with us in, in the previous NHK partnerships. Um, this is a very similar structure. So uh, it, it will, uh, we're going in uh, as, a, as a joint venture partner with Stillwater Capital as the developer um, partner. And as I mentioned, you know, we are going to be 70-30 partners and uh, together we'll, we'll fund you know, $15.8 million of equity. There's a hurdle structure that's in place between the partners. And this hurdle structure is exactly the same as compared to our last uh, offering on Storybook. And whereby, you know, we get 100% of the return until we uh, satisfy a 10% cumulative preferred return over our investment. And we'll, we'll, we'll capture 75% of it um, until we capture a 16% preferred return cumulatively. And then if, if it, it really exceeds that and, and you know, is a home run, which you know, everyone expects it will be, then we share 50-50 with the, the developer partner and, and you know, in, in a true promote fashion. And the, the reason why we're doing this is obviously you know, we're structuring a, a promo structure weighted to the back end because we want to motivate and incentivize the developer to do better and to, to really push the envelope which will only benefit, you know, the overall, um, you know, JV uh, joint venture partnership. Um, the NHK offering terms again are are are, you know, I would say even ident identical to um, our previous offerings. Um, we're targeting a four-year investment term, um, and um, the target closing date. Uh, you know, we we've seen. So much success on our storybook fundraising. Um, we've actually been able to close on that um, seven million dollar raise in in about thirty days. And so our target closing date is is from here to to November. Um, so we're giving a, ourselves about a, a, a you know six weeks thereabouts time frame. Um, there will be a one time subscription fee of five percent. Um, and the minimum investment amount is at is set at, at hundred thousand. Um, again, the, identical to to the previous offering. Um, now, the uh, target partnership cash flow. So this is you know a look at what the the NHK uh, Mansfield Limited Partner uh, partnership uh, you know the partnership cash flow will look like. As I mentioned, uh, we'll be contributing $11 million. And you know, through the, the, the operation mm -hmm. and the eventual exit sale of the property, uh, we're expecting to, to get uh, about a $24 million distribution. Uh, from, and, and most the lion's share of that will come from the actual sale of the, the, the property in year four. And therefore, so the net cash flow to the partners are going to be $12.4 million or thereabouts. And at the partnership level, this will yield about a 30% IRR with a 2.1x uh, equity multiple. 
And from here, this includes the, the, the GP um, you know, share of, of the, the returns as well as the, the limited partners. So you, you, you the, the investors um, share. Um, and the investor share, net investor share, you know, on, on the investment amount, you know, out of your pocket, we're expecting about a, a 1.78x uh, return. So every $100,000 you're investing, you'll be getting about $176,000 back uh, is our expectation or our target, um, I should say. Um, the, the projections are, are laid out in, in the um, PPM. Um, or those of you who are not familiar with our, our, um, our offering structure, you know, it, we have a, a, a holistic document called um, a, uh, um, an offering document. Uh, and in there, you'll see um, actual projections, uh, targeted projections for the limited partners um, share of, of this uh, return. Quickly uh, on the timeline from here on, um, again, uh, we're expecting to you know, raise from here till say November. Um, and the construction is slated to, to, to start um, early next year, uh, probably you know, first thing next year. Um, and um, it's about a, a, a 24 month construction period. Uh, it's gonna be, phased so that the phase one construction and, and the reason why we're phasing it is obvious right uh, we want to you know start leasing up as, as fast as we can and uh, therefore the, the phase one construction completion is slated to be you know just a, a little over a year from from the the construction commencement but overall you know I would still consider that the the overall uh, construction phase will be you know 20 to 24 month construction phase and then there is an additional um, call it 18 24 month of a stabilization this that's the lease up period and once it's leased up and you have tenants in place and you have a, a cash flow a robust cash flow that's typically when we would, you know, go out for a sale of the, the, the property. And as I mentioned, you know, in our kind of investment thesis conversation, um, we expect there to be, you know, a heightened interest in, in these types of assets, especially centrally operated, centrally, you know, managed um, single family rental properties such as this. Um, and once the, the, Asset is sold, that's you know, our, our, our exit. A, a quick nod to our partner, Stillwater Capital. Um, you know, through the, the 20 plus, plus years that you know, our team has worked on, on the CMB Regional Center platform you know, in the EV5 space, um, we've done multiple deals with Stillwater Capital uh, mostly in, in, in multifamily um, assets. Uh, the Crosby that you see um, is, a, is a good example. It's, a, it's the latest of their multifamily development in Deep Ellum uh, in, in Dallas. And um, it's it, it sold at, at, at top prices. Um, and I think it's, 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 uh, it's, it's public, um, but uh, you know, we were able to exit that, that property uh, very early. And as a matter of fact, um, their business model, you know, as we saw, just saw uh, even on, on the Mansfield deal, um, is that is to build, operate, lease up, stabilize, and sell. Um, however, they've been able to, to overachieve their, the, 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 the target. And so uh, from breaking ground, to construction and exit, uh, we've done the math and it took them about 3.3 years as compared to you know, the original business plan of, of, of you know, four plus years to, to achieve that. Case in point, um, our first um, NHK partnership, um, it was a, uh, a multifamily apartment development in um, San Antonio, Texas, um, in 2019. Um, it's constructed and it's uh, in its lease up phase, 
But uh, lo and behold, um, unsolicited, there was an offer to, to purchase the, uh, that apartment. And so um, just yesterday, uh, we signed the, the, the purchase and sale contract. And so uh, we're expecting to exit that investment in, in 28 months time and make the, the same you know, level of return that we expected in, in the beginning. So again, this isn't uh, you know, meant to um, sway you or, or, or you know, give you an idea that this is always gonna be the case, but um, you know, it's more of, of the, the business plan, the, the, the mindset that the team has on this side, that um, you know, the, the, the quicker you get to a lease up or even before you get to a lease up, if there's a good opportunity to exit, then we'll take that opportunity. Um, and so, you know, it, we counted the month, number of month. And so it came out to 28 month exit uh, from the, the, the uh, origination of that, that investment, which in my view is, is, a, is a pretty good success. <laughs> um, I, uh, this is the end of my presentation. Uh, it, we're just under an hour. Um, as I, previewed in the beginning. Um, I'll have um, Matthew join us now and um, go through some of the questions that we might have received over the, the course of the presentation. And also, I think, uh, you know, Matthew, uh, by the way, a lot of you might have already talked to him, uh, but he's truly out there talking with our investors, our potential investors, you know, answering their questions, all of that. So he, he's a, a, a crucial member of, of this entire um, endeavor. Um, and also he's got a lot of feedback from you know, the, the types of questions that are asked uh, most frequently. And so we'll try to go over some of those with, with Matthew as well. Matthew, you there? Yeah, Neil, uh, great presentation. Once again, anyone, if you have any questions um, regarding this webinar, just type in the Q&A. Um, in the meantime, we're going to quickly go over uh, some of the commonly asked questions. Um, you know, one that we always get is, you know, how much can I invest and how may I invest? As Neil mentioned in one of the slides, the minimum investment is $100,000. Um, from there on, you can invest in $50,000 increments. For example, our last offering about the average investor invested roughly $300,000. So it gives me an idea of the investment amount. Um, in regards to how you can invest, um, there's multiple ways. You can invest as just an individual. You can invest um, through an LLC. You can invest through a trust. Um, if you have any kind of questions on a type of investment you're going, you're looking at, you know, you can always feel free to ask Neil or I. We can run it past our um, compliance team. Also, one of the other commonly asked questions is, you know, this is um, both domestic and foreign investments. So. Uh, what are the tax situations and the consequences? So, you know, these are questions that I can ask and, and or not ask, but answer, but not give tax advice. As Neil mentioned, again, you know, a majority of the profits and distributions will come at the sale of the investment. So um, the majority of the taxes will be taxed at capital gains. Um, also, if you are a foreign tax person, you will be taxed at a with, withheld amount, which is, um, you know, I think a, a base of 35%. Once again, though, there are tax treaties available, um, whether you're investing from Japan or other countries, there could be uh, a reduction in that withholding. So I would suggest that you would uh, consult with your tax advisor. Matthew, again, this isn't uh, you know, us giving tax advice, because obviously we're not tax people, but uh, it just, you know, from my experience, I think the, the uh, we've had an experience with Japanese clients, I think, uh, and Japan and the U.S. has a, a long-standing tax treaty. And according to that, the withholding came down to 10%, 15%, was it? Yeah, I'm not too sure if it's my speaker, but your voice was sound very raspy. But um... okay. I apologize. So, yeah, I was just asking, uh, again, this is not a, a tax advice in any sense, but just you know, from our experience, um, we've had a Japanese plan just as an experience, you know, of, of tax treaties and how what that can do uh, 
to the withholding uh, because of the, the U.S.-Japan tax treaty, their uh, withholding came down to, was it 10 percent? Yes, that's correct. It depended on, you know, how much the investor was investing. There were different stair steps if they were a 25 percent or, let's say, a, a majority stakeholder in the partnership. They even had further um, tax reductions. But I believe, yes, it did go down to a 10 percent. Um, from that country due to that tax treaty. So I think some, everyone want to want to look into. Right. So it's definitely something worth uh, looking into, if, if, especially if you're a foreign person. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Um, one of the main questions, it's very just kind of basic. Uh, investors always ask, you know, what are the risk factors um, for this investment? What's the security of the investment? Sure. So, um, you know, uh, through through the, the the twenty plus years that the um, you know that we the the principals uh, have managed uh, you know investments on the under the the CMB banner in the EV five investment offerings um, and or NHK uh, you know we've we've run the gamut as as I mentioned earlier um, this includes you know de- doing first lien you know lendings um, is my voice okay I've- yeah, it's better now. A lot better now. Great, great. Uh, first, you know, uh, lean uh, senior lending uh, facilities. We've done mezzanine lending facilities, whereby our main collateral piece was the the, the membership pledge, the ownership in in the the operating entity of of, of that asset. Um, we've also, you know, more recently in one of our NHK platform, um, done a preferred equity loan structure. And, uh, you might, and, and you remember this, um, this was, you know, the, at the height of the, the COVID-19 era, we were doing, a, an investment, uh, into, uh, a new JW hotel here in Dallas. And so we wanted to create some, some brackets, some, some measure of, of protection um, because of the, 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 the background, mm-hmm. right? Um, doing a hotel during COVID, right? Um, and therefore we, we implemented a, a loan structure with collateral and, and obligation to pay and, and such. Now, um, I want to make sure that our, our um, listeners today understand that, um, you know, it's same with the, the storybook um, single family rental deal, um, and same here. This is a, a straight up joint venture, um, you know, agreement with the developer partner. So we are a seventy percent partner. They are thirty percent partner. We're gonna have a, a a development management agreement with Stillwater, and so uh, this does not have the 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 backdrop of a of a loan structure. The, no obligation to pay. No, you know, no. Um, contractual obligation to repay the investment amount. However, uh, as you mentioned, you know, uh, you, I think the it comes down to the 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 strength of the market, right? And and our asset, and that's why I think you know we we spent a good portion of our our presentation to go through you know, the thesis of of you know what SFR is and why SFR properties. Today is kind of in the in the um, you know it, 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 it is popular, right? And and why the institutional investors um, are you know flocking into this space. Um, and again, you know the 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 operation is is quite simple if you look at it, right? So we're gonna you know invest this money uh, and leverage it with with debt so that our return you know, becomes better and build. Uh, and as you saw, you know, with Stillwater, we have, you know, um, myriads of, of, of experience of, of doing this um, act, exact same, you know, routine process. And at the end of the, the construction, uh, you know, sell uh, with a, a fully leased up, uh, you know, property and, Read the benefit of, of, of having gone through and, and taken the risk to do that. And so um, the to me, the risk profile is such that, okay, do you think that 
you know, this will be up. You know, is there a strong market demand, which I think we, we amply, you know, um, discussed about? Um, is there ample demand for, you know, for an exit, you know, for, for some um, third party to be able to, you know, purchase this asset so that the existing investors can exit at, at that time frame? Which again, I think we we amply uh, you know provided evidence that this will be the case, and you know our experience you know again not to you know um, kind of cover it up with our experience, but it, it it's it's um, it, it's something that's done on a routine basis. I, I would say. Okay, thank you for that. I'm just going to go ahead. Um, uh, another question I had was the fee structure, but I I noticed that there are live okay. questions that um, people are asking this. So I'm just gonna go ahead and jump into the Q&A, live Q&A, if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, yeah, the first question is, what are the major factors that affect equity multiples? Um, so I'm, I'm actually looking at the, the live questions and I think number one and two are, are quite similar. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so, uh, Answering the second question first, the, the assumed cap rate here is a 5% cap rate um, at, at the 1.96 per square foot level. Um, and that will achieve approximately a 40% value add from, you know, um, from where the, um, the, the cost basis is. Um, and so, um, I think that answers that question. Uh, the major factors that affect the equity multiple, again, you know, anything can affect the equity multiple, right? If, if the, um, the rent, uh, per square foot rent average level would, would, you know, increase or decrease, that would have an effect because typically, you know, at, at exit, what we look at is a reversion value, meaning, you know, it's a, it's a typical exercise of, you know, what's your net operating income? Right, and the, obviously the the rent per square foot would ha would have a direct uh, implication to that um, operating income, net operating income, and then the the next you know part of that is you know what is the cap rate, and cap rate is is typically driven by you know the the marketplace and the, the capital markets, um, and that's why I think it's important. It was important for us to kind of go through. The different um, you know activities by these large institutions um, you know in wanting to to have a piece of this uh, this asset uh, type, and that is actually driving up the the cap rate. Um, and you know the five cap um, I think today is achievable today. And I think you know with the the advent of additional you know um, you know big bucks coming into the space, um, I think that's that's sustainable. And as you mentioned, I think earlier, you know, the, the um, potential, the, the executed PSA for our Augusta, which is just a traditional wrap garden uh, apartment, um, has achieved a, a cap rate lower than 5%. So the market is indicating that the cap rate, you know, as of right now is lower. Therefore, um, I think the 5% is a very conservative approach. Mm -hmm. uh, one question was about the, the target rate for the mezzanine loan. Um, I don't know if you wanted to get into that. Yeah, so um, to be clear, the the current offering as it's offered, um, it, it does not go into uh, the, the mezzanine loan. So the mez loan will be provided by a CMB affiliate. Um, but, um, you know, our, our investments, our scope of investment does not include uh, exposure into the mezzanine side. What happens if you do not find a buyer? I think uh, highlighting, you know, Stillwater's relationships is the key. Sure. So um, the the direct answer to that would be, you know, as seventy percent owner of, of a of an existing, you know, facility, you know, we we would reap the benefit of that operation, right? So um, the reason why we're talking about, you know, uh, exiting at year four. Uh, by, you know, by um, selling the, the property is because, you know, we think that's most advantageous 
whereby you know once the lease up has happened then and and especially looking at the you know the uh, the interest level that's you know that's with the uh, institutional investors in the space that it would be most advantageous for us to exit at that time but it, it doesn't have to be that way um, where the the partnership is going to be a 70 percent owner of that property and reap the benefit of operations um, as long as we hold on to it and um, uh, to to Matthew's point and, and this is where you know the the business plan, the, the, the experience and the, uh, of, of the, the, the teams, it becomes important. Um, you know, on our side, on, on the NHK side, our, our principals, our team, you know, have gone through, you know, over $3 billion of, of um, you know, exposure in, in commercial real estate. Uh, I mean, we, I, I think I stopped counting on, you know, the number of deals that we exited, um, um, you know, after a successful, you know, um, investment period. Same goes with Stillwater Capital. Um, you know, I, I think their, their number of, uh, of dollars in terms of, um, um, you know, deals that they've exited, I think exceeds like $8 billion or something. Yeah, $8 billion, yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, this is something that, that both teams are really adept at doing. Um, Stillwater, one thing we, we, we like about that team is that they don't, you know, uh, venture into forays where they, they, they don't have a competitive advantage in. In other words, you know, because they think, uh, you know, hotel looks good, they don't venture into hotel. They are multifamily, they're, you know, residential guys that stuck to their game. And that's why, you know, they're reaping the benefit today. Thank you. Um, the next question is construction costs went up since COVID. How are we prepared for this? It's almost doubled. Well, the 80 some million dollar uh, budget that you saw is uh, the construction cost having gone up. Um, so, even compared to our last one, this has gone up, you know, quite substantially. And so, you know, the 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 better question or the the, the better focus, I think, is okay. Under this cost, you know, can we make a profit, right? So again, if if the cost goes up so much that it, there, it, it becomes impossible, you know, to make a profit in the current market environment, then we wouldn't do it, right? Um, fortunately, that is not the case. You there? Uh yeah, I'm here. I think there was a, a glitch. I apologize. Um, just continuing from from where I was, um, the uh, the budget. So we enter into what we call a GMP or gross max pricing uh, con um, contract with the con con contractor. So at a certain point, the budget is going to get locked in, uh, and uh, we're able to do that by purchasing out the, the, the materials, the labor, the, the subcontractors ahead of time. And that's how we, we lock in the, the, the level of, 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 of budget. Um, again, uh, the, the focus is that, you know, under the current, um, you know, situation, yes, there has been a disruption in the supply chain, and that has caused some of the, the, the materials to, to, to go up. Um, lumber, I think, was well publicized. Um, it has since come down a bit, but you know, not to the level of where it was pre-pandemic per se. But again, you know, we're we're taking that into consideration when we're making these, uh, you know, projections and, and targets. Okay. Uh, there's the next uh, few questions. It's regarding the equity. Um, you know, I'll repair pursue with NHK. So. I'm not too sure if they're asking their equity or if they're asking um, our equity and the sponsor's equity if it's pair for sue. Um, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm reading um, through the, the questions. So I think there's a bit of a, a confusion here. Um, 
Okay, so should you accept and you know the the offer to invest into this NHK Mansfield LP partnership? Um, you, uh, Mr. Maxim, uh, become a a limited partner to the partnership to the NHK partnership. So we are essentially in 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 a in business together. So I, as in NHK. Uh, as a general partner, manages the day-to-day -day of the partnership, uh, including you know the the oversight, including the, the the management of the investment, you know throughout the 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 next you know four whatever plus years that that may take for us to exit. Now uh, that uh, enables um, you as a limited partner to enjoy a passive uh, investment into this commercial real estate space, you know, without having to. You know, deal with the lawyers with 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 the the actual you know buying, selling, operating of the asset, and that's that's the 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 uh, the offer. That's the um, the selling point, I would say. Um, and that and therefore, uh, your question about being Perry Pursue, I'm I'm not too sure what that was asking, but um, NHK is. Uh, between the LPs, the LPs are all you know treated equal, um, and 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 NHK is a general partner managing that that partnership. And if you're asking what between the relationship between NHK and the Stillwater partner, um, NHK partner has a uh, a priority of payment over the Stillwater partner um, in the first stages of return. So as I as we talk through the the um, the promote structure, the um, up until the 10% accumulated accrued um, uh, uh, return, we capture 100% of, of whatever proceeds uh, up until 16% accrued cumulative return to the NHK partnership, we capture 75%. And therefore, you know, we have a priority over the first monies that, that flow from the investment. And if you know it, it, it really overachieves, and and there's a, 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 a additional monies to be made after that that you know 16% upfront, then we share as a promote 50%, 50 percent 50. So we go in pari pursue at that time between the uh, the Stillwater partner and NHK partner. So essentially, you know. Uh, Overall, we have the the, the priority, uh, you know, within the the existing promote structure. Okay, um, and the NHK fees. Uh, and again, we also mentioned this in, in the presentation. Uh, but the um, again, the NHK general partner is responsible for day to day operations. Um, and so the, the, the fees that we're, we're going to be charging is the 5% upfront um, uh, subscription fee. It's a, it's a one-time fee. Um, so if you invest $100,000, then $95,000 would go into the actual investments. And that would be the basis of your capital account statements. Um, and then um, the... Um, Apologize. Um, and then, I apologize, uh, technical error. <laughs> um, can you still hear me? I apologize. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, right, so, so um, there's that one time fee of 5%. So $95,000 would go into the actual investment. 5,000 would come to the, the um, NHK uh, company as, as a fee. Um, now, uh, there is typically an annual fee, but we're waiving for the first three years. So the annual fee of 2% is only gonna kick in uh, on the third year of investment. So, um, you know, in order, because, it, during the first, you know, two years, it's construction phase, and therefore there won't be any any cash flow necessarily, and you know we're 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 cognizant of that, we're mindful of that, and once you receive your funds, your original investment, any um, upside, any any profit that you make, there is a carried interest 
of, of uh, for NHK of, of 20%. And that is not per annum, that's just overall. So if, if you, if the, um, you know, if you make the, um, it's, it's a 20% of the overall stock of, of, uh, of profit that you make. And when I, and as I mentioned in the, in the PPM, um, the private placement memo that you will see a simulation of what the return to the limited partners will look like. And that figure will actually be um, after all the fees are deducted from the, the, um, the, part, the, the operation. So that's net dollar to your pocket back. Okay. Uh, what's the interest rate on the construction loan? Well, the um, typically uh, construction lenders want to see that there is equity already in place. And so the construction loan will be signed up after our equity is in place. So we you know, right now the construction loan is not signed in yet, but just from experience and very typical to these sorts of deals, the construction loan these days are, I think, Anywhere between 400 to you know 500 basis points over you know LIBOR, um, so that would be you know four or five percent interest rate uh, would be a typical um, rate. And again, you know that's all baked in. That's all uh, uh, you know assumed in our pro forma when we talk about the level of returns that that we uh, we target. Okay, um, wow. Uh, okay, what proportion of homes should be leased to cover debt service for both MES and senior? Um, I'm not sure what this means. So I, I think, uh, are we asking like uh, occupancy rates? Because the, the lease up will probably be Pretty quick. So our expectation, our, our projection for the lease up is you know less than 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 12 months. And the both uh, loans, the construction and the the, the MES loan, will both carry a, a typically an interest reserve of typically 30 months in order to uh, um, accommodate for the the lease up phase. So during the first 30 months or so there is no debt service that needs to get the, the paid out of pocket. So it's all again, baked into the, the, the entire budget. So what that means is once, you know, you go through that, that lease up, um, then, you know, it's able to, to service the, the, the debt, you know, either it be the, the senior and the mess, but during, until that happens, it's already, you know, prepaid in a sense. And that's very typical in, in, in you know, these commercial uh, real. Yeah, when okay. we're looking at um, what I recall in the financials, it seems like that's more like a break even kind of question on, you know, what are the expenses? If, if there were no contingencies and reserves in place, I think if I recall, um, it would be about a 60 to 65% um, leaks up uh, to get to that um, covered debt service ratio. So 20% per annum. Um. So I'm assuming that's talking about the carried interest. Again, it's not a per annum. Uh, it's, it's a 2% annual fee that kicks in on the third anniversary of investment. So, um, so there's no 20% per annum. No, no. Um, So again, uh, the question of construction cost overruns. Um, so I think I think we kind of covered that. Um, so the you know by the time we we go hard on this investment, um, we will have you know cons construction contracts, GMP contracts that are locked in, and you know again it, it, it's a it's a I guess somewhat short um, you know construction period construction phase so we're gonna you know buy out a lot of the the material the the labor the the subcontracts uh beforehand so that we lock in the costs 
Having said that, um, if if there is ever a cost overrun, um, typically you know there is contingency that is already um, uh, baked in to the projections. Um, it, the contingencies at the uh, the owner level, uh, which again would be part of the eighty two million dollars. Contingency at the hard cost level, at the contractor level, which uh, again these are all very typical you know commercial U.S. commercial real estate factors. But uh, you know, contingency baked in at the hard cost level. So when the GMP contractor signs their deal, uh, they would you know uh, include a a call it five percent, whatever six percent, depending on the work uh, contingency in it. So you know there is buffer after buffer. If if it is uh, you know exceeds that even, then there's you know um, provisions in the JV agreements about uh, the ability to do. Uh, you know, member loans, the ability to do um, capital calls, again, very, very typical to such, um, you know, um, JV investments into, into real estate. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know maybe if you wanted to talk a little bit, you know, about Stillwater and their vertical integration and kind of the uh, construction arm that they operate and the GC arm and the management, you know, uh, when change orders or cost of runs do um, become, you know, a factor, the you know capability of getting together as a team and you know figuring these solutions out is at a, at a faster pace whereas typical you know most worrisome issue is if when you can't agree on something then you have delays and then construction is delayed and that's where costs tend to pile up but with their vertically integrated concept it, it definitely executes faster so yeah and and matthew to your point i think you're, you're addressing you know the i guess the the risk of, of you know having a dispute between you know the owner and the and the contractor right which which happens right uh, you know we're living in a real world so um, but to your point in this case the 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 dispute or the likelihood of a dispute is 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 pretty you know low because uh, you know it, it still water has been operating as a as a vertically integrated um, team so again you know just by order of of I guess you know, um, importance. Um, the, the first order of importance is, uh, David, that again, you know, a lot of these uh, materials, laborers will, you know, have been already locked in when, when you know, we, we go in. And again, there are contingencies that are baked into the, uh, the, the budgets um, for, you know, necessary change orders, for example, for, for things to that nature, for uh, but if there is a dispute at the at the end, again, you know, it's a it's a hierarchical you know conversation right now. But if if you know none of this is able to cover the whatever the cost overrun, and there is a dispute, then as as Matthew mentioned, you know, it's a vertically integrated structure, and therefore you know the the likelihood of you know a a a dispute, a litigation, a mediation between the, the contractor and the owner is slim because it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's vertically integrated. Thanks. Um, the next question that I kind of, uh, it's a good question is kind of the journey of the $100,000 investment. Will there, will there be uh, dividends um, or will it be one bullet payment at the end exit? So, um, the 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 expectation the the projection the target um, is that again it's a two year construction I'm gonna re really simplify this down two year construction two year lease up sell right so during that two year lease up if there is a, a distributable amount then we we'll, we might see a distribution again that's gonna be you know in in comparison of magnitude. Pretty minimal as compared to the the back end, you know, balloon payment um, upon sale of the asset, and that's where the bulk of our return will be made. So it's a deferred structure, um, in in that sense, and uh, you know, true to the nature of a of a you know equity JV investment, uh, there won't be an annual coupon necessarily based on some sort of a contractual obligation. Okay. And just to quickly uh, clarify, you know, if you do want to review kind of the cash flow illustration, you know, this will all be disclosed in the PPM. So if you um, would like to further review that, you can always uh, sign an NDA. We can send you the offering document. All this will be outlined in that. Good point. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, the, yes, okay. The $5,000 fee, just to finish your question, will be uh, deducted out upfront. So if you don't want that to happen, then um, you, know, you can invest 150,000. Uh, you know, again, the, the increment there is you know, one unit is $50,000. Um, and you know the minimum is two, two units, hundred thousand. What's the development and yield? Development yields. Um, not sure what that means. Uh, <laughs> uh, are we talking about uh, if Turn we're talking about or? We're talking about the partnership, NHK partnership yield. I think that's the the figure we saw. Um, well, why don't why don't we why don't we go on to the next ones and then maybe come back yeah. to it? Source of funds. Um, you know, I guess when when if you were to move forward, what are the questions and you know the qualifications to become an investor and and the funds that qualify? Sorry, I sorry. <laughs> I sorry, uh, there's a source of funds. Uh, pretty much like you know, if you are planning to invest, you know, what what may I use? Do I have to be an accredited investor? You need to go into that a little bit, and um, obviously the background of, of verifying those funds. Um, yeah, so this is for accredited investors. So um, accreditation is important for us. Um, we hire a broker dealer, um, Prevail Capital, to um, help us with the, the accreditation process. So uh, in order to be accredited, typically, um, you know, that the investor has to have uh, at least $200,000 of income uh, the last two years, or if, you know, uh, with the spouse, $300,000 of income last two years, or if you want to qualify under the um, the, the asset, uh, then you have to have at least a million dollars in asset uh, that is outside of your main residence. Uh, I think that's, it. and there are, you know, sub uh, regulations to the entitlement uh, accreditation, but, um, you know, those are the, 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 the big bullet points. Um, the, obviously, uh, Reg S, Reg D also apply. Um, so if you're a, a, a foreign investor uh, not residing in the U.S., then you would um, you know, file for a Reg S exemption, which means that you're, you're not bound to the, you know, the jurisdiction of, of the, uh, the U.S. Um, SEC. Okay, thank you for that. The internal rate of return, IRR of 20% at the time of exit, at what rate minimum NHK will exit? I think they're asking, you know, if there were, you know, what minimum rate would we exit at? I guess if the project was not performing as, as anticipated. Um, I don't think this is something that, you know, we would mandate necessarily. So again, um, you know, it's a, it's a live, you know, organism in a sense, because um, as, as I mentioned, you know, if it's looking to be more profitable to, you know, reap the benefit of the operation, then, then you know, that'll take precedence. And the IRR is a, it's just an indication. And so um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, there is not a mandate that says, you know, at what rate minimum that the investment will be exited or not. Um, it's, uh, it's a matter of, of, you know, again, we have a target for our, our operation and our exit, uh, but it's it, it by no means a, a, a mandate necessarily. So it, I think, you know, coming from probably, I'm just assuming here, but, um, you know, this isn't a portfolio management um, that you might see with, you know, your typical, you know, asset, you know, portfolio manager necessarily. This is a, uh, an investment into an actual um, 
you know, property into an actual development of a, of a commercial real estate asset. And therefore, um, you know, the, the general partner in this case, the NHK, uh, because it's not operating in a portfolio fashion, does not have a mandate as to its return uh, profile, if that makes sense. Sure does. So um, to get back to the development yield, he was uh, wanting to know what is the projected NOI and the cap rate. So as you discussed, I think we cover the cap rate. Um, it's going to be 5%. Uh, this 5% um, based off uh, NOI at the disposition date, which is approximately going to be $5,030,000. So, and I think, and, and just looking through uh, Maxim, uh, you'll find a lot of these answers in the private placement memo. Um, in order for you to, um, you know, for us to be able to send you that, um, there's an NDA process. Uh, but with that, I think we should be able to, to send you that. And, and obviously, Matthew, myself, um, Vitaly, um, you know, we're, we're all here for, for to answer for the questions and, you know, and anything. So. I think we, we, we can do that. Okay. I think that might address all the questions we have. Okay. Yeah, all these oh, are related. So Matt, that seems, uh, <laughs> he's writing us in real time. Okay, this is good. All right, sounds good. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, with the NDA, again, I think we should find a lot of these. Um, just a, a, a quick reminder. Um, so and this is, I, I guess, uh, for, for Maxim especially, um, were the, uh, the storybook, which was our, our last um, um, single family rental offering, uh, you know, we closed in, in, in like 30 days record time, uh, were also, Similarly, expecting that on this deal. Um, now we're at the last cost of, of um, finalizing the JV agreement and the offering documents. So I would probably um, expect to have the offering documents, including the, the uh, private placement memo, available to our uh, prospective investors in the next week or so. So once that is done, uh, Maxim, you, you'll have uh, you know uh, the first copy, copy of it. Um, so. Um, yeah, well, thank you for the interest and all the good questions. Um, and obviously, uh, Matthew, myself, we're all always here to answer further questions. Um, so um, thank you again. Yeah, thank you.